I will briefly introduce the two speakers. We are very honored and happy to have them with us. Benjamin Moffat, he's a senior lecturer in politics and Australian Research Council DICRA fellow in the National School of Arts at the Australian Catholic University, Melbourne. He is an expert in comparative politics, contemporary political theory and political communication, and focuses on contemporary populism across the globe. You've, you've probably seen his bio and the invitation. I would like to mention his many recent books on populism, political meritocracy and populism, curse or cure. And he's also the co-author of Populism in Global Perspective, a performative and discursive approach. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. Pleasure to, pleasure to be here. And uh, I would like also to introduce William Hasselberger to you. He's a professor and um, a philosopher and a professor of politics in the Institute for Political Studies at the Catholic University of Portugal, where he leads um, the research group on technology, data, and politics uh, in the University Political Studies Research Center. Uh, William is also visiting research fellow at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture in the University of Virginia. And he's interested, he's a research interest concerned philosophical questions on human nature, ethics and moral character, autonomy and free agency, and the nature of emotions. So um, I think we will have a very interesting conversation tonight on the topic that we are dealing with. Well, actually, populism is on the rise. Fake news, bubbles, misinformation also appear to be on the rise, and I don't think I need to give any example. Um, I found an interesting title in reading about COVID things, and it's a title that Branko Milanovic, a famous expert in, uh, in inequality issues, global inequality issues, um, has been um, throwing around, and the title is that COVID-19 is the first truly global event in the history of humankind. Well, of course, there are some, let's say, hyperbole in this, but uh, I think it's interesting because uh, this is a kind of global event in which we never met, met face to face, still we experience the same thing or something very similar, thanks to technological development. That's why I think it's very interesting to devote some time to discuss the issues of populism and truth in the media, because um, this set, the setting of technological change that we are living with, allow um, the past, allow to see the enormous gap between the people and the elite. We see it all the time. And also inequality was there even before social media were around, but social media exposed this inequality. And um, I would like to mention that inequality is one of the topics dealt with in the paper that the working group number one on vulnerability uh, is, is highlighting. And inequality is also, um, very much connected to internal populist dynamics and this vulnerability of society because of excessive inequality, it also extends across countries. And we also see that national political events are also um, spread around very easily and tend to play a role in determining the political discourse also in other countries. 
So in our seminar, we will explore the relationship between populist media, new media in particular, and public health in view of exploring solutions, meaningful, sound solutions. So here are my opening questions for Ben and Bill. Maybe we can go in this order. And so Ben, maybe it's very good if you can help us uh, by starting with framing the issue of populism. What is populism? A million dollar okay. question. Oh, sorry. Oh yeah, that's it. Go on. Uh, that, yeah, um, what is populism? Academics debate this endlessly. The term gets thrown around a lot, but basically it comes down to being a political phenomenon that sees the core divide in society as between the people and the elite. Academics argue whether it, that's an ideology, whether it's a strategy, whether it's a political style or a discourse, but it always comes back to that divide between the people and the elite. And I think um, in terms of thinking about our discussion today, What's important to note is that those terms are so vague and so open that they can be utilized by political actors across the political spectrum um, and the ideological spectrum. So that's why we can have right wing populists uh, speaking in the name of the people versus the elite. And on the right, that tends to, to be filled with, you know, if we think of the people and the elite as kind of empty buckets that you can fill with different content, they tend to fill it with a kind of socio-cultural content, you know, the people, uh, you know, at least in Europe, you know, the native people versus the cultural and political elites who are seen as allied with multiculturalism, cosmopolitanism, um, immigrants and so forth. On the left, that tends to take a socio-economic cue um, where the elite, uh, the business elite, uh, the global elite who are kind of punching down on, and taking advantage of, you know, the little guy, the, the, the real people. And we could think there of the example of, um, uh, you know, 99% versus the 1% that Occupy Wall Street talked about, or even the discourse of Bernie Sanders in the US. So the people versus the elite, and those are very flexible uh, terms that can be used across the political spectrum. Yeah. That's, that's interesting because um, this can open the issue of what media can uh, do in this so open um, polarization between different groups. And maybe uh, this is something we can ask Bill to, to focus. We have um, social media and politics as an issue because uh, the representation of what's the people and what are the elite also goes through the working of the media. And uh, uh, we know that old medias and new medias can be different on this respect. And maybe um, the two forms, unless, oh, oh, of course, the two extremes and the very many things that are in the middle, um, may have a different way of organizing the thinking of the people. So uh, since you are, Bill, you are an expert on uh, um, cognitive biases, artificial intelligence, data and politics, can you elaborate on this and tell us something about this relationship between social media and politics? Absolutely, thank you for inviting me. So I think the place to start with is to um, sort of appreciate something distinctive about the contemporary moment that maybe it doesn't get enough attention, which is that we live in an era of inf information overload or information saturation, right? So, um, you do a search on, in Google on a political topic, and, and it's likely that you'll get thousands of results. You, the social media uh, platforms, which now constitute the main uh, sources of information for many people in advanced economies, often have bottomless feeds where you can just keep going and go like in Twitter and Instagram. 
And it's simply impossible for a, a human being who, alas, has a finite lifespan and uh, only a certain amount of attention, attentional resources. I mean, psychology has um, been studying uh, the, the effect of social media and sort of information technology generally on our capacities of, of attention, our attention spans. We only have so much of it and there's a lot, there's so much information out there. And so what ends up happening is uh, that many people use what uh, cognitive and social psychologists call cognitive biases to make sense of um, this deluge of, of information, say about COVID. What's really going on with COVID? How dangerous is it really? You, you know, you do that, you search that in, in, on, on Google and you will get an impossible amount of content, information in the sense of just, uh, you know, potentially good information, potentially bad information, totally bunk information, right? You just get this deluge. So the way that we uh, deal with this is we tend to rely upon certain mental shortcuts, many of which we may not even be aware of, that we may not be aware that we're using. For instance, uh, it's a very sim simple one that you'll recognize straight away is um, ten our tendency to focus on easily obtainable information. So we focus on the results that come at the top of a search, uh, a, a query, a search um, engine. Uh, there's a joke in, in big tech that the, the easiest place to hide a dead body is on the fourth page of a Google search. Meaning, in other words, nobody goes to the fourth page of a Google search, right, in, in, in researching a, a topic. Now that is, a potentially a real problem because the way that uh, platforms like Google and YouTube and so, you know, the major social media platforms operate, they are not structured so as to direct us to the truth. They are struck, I mean, per se, right? They can do so, but that's not the, the, the way that they are engineered. They are engineered to uh, maximize engagement so the amount of time that you're gonna spend clicking and staying on, on, uh, online. So uh, if you're getting your primary information about politics from your um, Google searches or your social media feed, the, the nature of that information is uh, conditioned by uh, your search history, um, the kind of psychological profile and statistical model that the algorithms running in the background have built about you on the basis of what you've done in the past. Uh, and I'll just point to one example in which this can have real political effects. There was a study done in India in um, 2015 by a psychologist named Richard Epstein that discussed he, he created a, a, a fake search engine called Kadoodle. And they gave, this was during a, 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 an election in India, and they gave people different, different um, hits in the, in the Kadoodle search, uh, which had different um, uh, content related to the candidates. And then there was a control group that didn't, that didn't have this, uh, you know, um, prefabricated you know, uh, uh, search engine. So what they discovered was that, well, people don't go down to the fourth page of the, of the search results and they use a cognitive shortcut, which is what tends to be at the top of the search results. Well, it's good enough, right? It's probably right. And they, they discovered that people's tendency to vote for the candidate selected by Kadoodle was as much as 12% higher than in the control group. So people were potentially really influenced by the, the nature of the information that they were shown, which was arbitrarily uh, you know, varied across these different people. 
So something so simple as what information comes to us easiest or, or quickest um, can really shape our political attitudes. Um, there are other biases that I think are, are relevant here too. Well, this is big enough. Maybe we can ask Ben if, if and how this shortcut way of proceeding helps populism as such. So is there a connection, or, or, let's say a relationship that goes from the kind of cognitive biases we have and populism? Well, I think there is. I, I mean, obviously populism existed well before social media emerged. Um, um, but I tend to think about uh, the kinds of things that Bill's talking about and the media landscape that we're now existing at, setting something of a perfect stage for populists. So um, what populists tend to offer is uh, a message that can break through uh, this, kind of, this kind of information overload that Bill talks about. The headline, populists know how to grab media attention. They know how to um, often um, present their narrative or present their message in a kind of spectacular, um, attention-grabbing way, relatively simple way. I'm not saying that their messages always are simple, but they tend to be able to frame them in that way. And as a result, they can tend to rise above um, the... Uh, the kind of the sea of information that's out there and garner that attention. And I think you need to only look, I mean, we've got people tuning in from countries all over the world. You only need to think about, you know, the populist party or the populist figure in your country. Um, and just the incredible amount of media attention, both old media attention and social media um, engagement they tend to get. Now I've done some study on, the kind of social media um, engagement populists get, and they do tend to get a lot more than others, uh, than the kind of mainstream politicians. That's not, to, I mean, anyone can do this. Any politician has this stage to work upon. And we can think of non-populist politicians like Barack Obama was fantastic at, at harnessing this. Justin Trudeau is, is, has been brilliant. Uh, the Canadian Prime Minister at uh, utilising um, social media. So has uh, Jacinda Ardern, the New Zealand Prime Minister. So, you know, this isn't a given for populists, but the stage is set for people who can cut through this stuff, get attention, just uh, get their message um, clearly through. Um, so, and, and appeal to that, those quick cognitive biases that Bill's talking about. Yeah, and uh, Bill, since you work on ethical dimensions and uh, I, I think the question must be asked, I think we can be aware of these mechanisms as soon as we stop a bit and reflect on the kind of exposure to this kind of communication mechanism uh, we have. So in a sense, once we know it, what kind of um, understanding can we develop on how, if and how, it is possible to take account of these mechanisms in order to make the potential vulnerability of people that um, are taking the shortcut um, in order to help citizens to acknowledge situation and to respond adequately to the situation? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a great question. I think that the first step is gaining awareness of how these biases work in ourselves. And, uh, and, and it's, of course, it's easier and more comfortable for us to know to the kind of these biases operative in people who disagree with us politically and to say, oh, well, you know, these guys are subject to all kinds of, uh, you know, biases and in-group bias and they're tribal and whatever but to, to recognize our own susceptibility to these biases. They come from, or there are plausible evolutionary psychological explanations for why we are biased in these ways. The, 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 the need, the kind of um, fitness value that they conferred on people 
uh, thousands of years ago in our, evolu in our evolutionary past. Uh, so we all have them. And it's a matter, you know, in, in our own case of being able to, to identify them. I think there are two more that are worth bringing on the table that I think are important in this case, in the case of populism. One is what's sometimes called negativity bias, which is the, the fact that uh, content that angers us, that, that is dark, that is... Um, it outrages us tends to be stickier than sort of positive content. It, it sticks with us. We remember it. We're more likely to share it. There's a fair amount of research on this that sort of negative outraged videos get shared much more frequently than um, sort of benign videos uh, on, on YouTube. So we're sort of and of course, this comes from perhaps, or it's speculated that this comes from the importance in our evolutionary past of paying attention to threats and dangers. That was important for us, you know, thousands of years ago. But it can also be short, it can also be sort of manipulated now by um, people who are aware of this or even just mindless algorithms that have no uh, appreciation of common sense or human values can just sort of tap into this and get and lock people into getting a lot of negative content and getting more and more angry. The other one that I think is everyone knows, but it's worth reflecting on is confirmation bias. The fact that we tend to seek out and find plausible and remember uh, information that tends that that um, supports our pre-existing views. And I mean. People can be shown, people of two different political persuasions can be shown the exact same information. And often the way they interpret the information will be, you know, one will say a school shooting or something in the US, a, a, a gun control advocate will um, see it as confirming a, a certain view, a um, sort of gun rights absolutist will see it as confirming their view and sort of select the aspects of the, inform of the information that um, fits with the pre-existing view. So the first step is being aware that we are all susceptible to this, no matter what the political persuasion is. Um, so I, I guess I'll leave it yeah. there for now, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, this is a question for Ben, but maybe both can elaborate. The pandemics offers, um, a reality background that can be analyzed according to your suggested lines of interpretation. Can you give us examples, either Bill or Ben, whoever wants to go first, with examples that connect with the pandemics, where in a sense, um, we all desire health and prosperity, and still we see polarization in societies around this fact of, of the existence of this virus, uh, which is sometimes disputed, by the way. Well, I think when it comes to populism, rather than talking about specific cases, I just say that what populism has, because the cases vary, some populists have done very well out of the pandemic and, and some haven't, uh, and they've kind of lost uh, they, they've lost some appeal in a time where scientists are, you know, we, we want to listen to scientists a bit more. Um, and I think, but I think what has gone on over at least the last two decades with populism becoming so mainstream is the continued um, contestation of um, elite knowledge and epistemological authority a lot of damage has been done, like leading up to this moment. So people not believing scientists, people believing that they can do their own, their own research, people looking to have other epistemic authorities rather than the um, rather than science um, and and political authorities. Um, that's been going on for a long time, and and I would also say that's not necessary that's not necessarily an irrational thing that people are not trusting that uh we started the century going to you know a war 
over non-existent weapons of mass destruction. People have, you know, people have gone through, um, you know, the ends of the, the first decade of this, this century with the financial collapse where elites were basically gambling with people's money. Um, so there is a reason that people do this, but this has been going on for a long time. This is not just about pop, kind of this, this distrust of elite knowledge has not come out of nowhere and it can't only be kind of pinned on, on uh, populist actors who emerge to take advantage of that. I think, I think that Bill will have more to say about that kind of landscape. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I would say that there was, uh, I mean, a certain amount of distrust of the political class kind of is native to uh, Americans in a way, but I think that um, there has been a growing distrust of what is often seen as a kind of detached technocratic elite that you know, sends their kids to Ivy League schools and at the same time uh, sings the praises of meritocracy when often, you know, uh, the, the potential for um, uh, upward social mobility in the United, at least in the case of the United States is been under a lot of strain since like say the 1970s. I think that the, the, the appeal of populist leaders in the, in, in the United, at least in the case of the United States often has comes from exactly the kind of suspicion of elite knowledge uh, and technocracy that Benjamin was talking about. I'm not sure the impact of the pandemic on that. I mean, in a way, I, I, I could see that going either way. I could see it, you know, people are, they do want to, you know, go to a doctor when they get sick and they want, you know, many people anyway want vaccines and want uh, elite knowledge in the medical sphere. But there's also, I think, concerns with this kind of distant management of society, uh, at least sort of reading into populist rhetoric, um, that the, pan the response to the pandemic may be seen as an instance of a kind of, um, you know, quantitative technocratic approach to, to society that is in fact anti-democratic or felt by, by people who are, are, to whom populist appeals uh, resonate, it feels sort of anti-democratic. Um, I would say one other thing, I think there is a kind of broader philosophical epistemic crisis of, I mean, this may be too sweeping, but epistemic crisis of something like late modernity. I mean, we, we see that um, I, I think that populism is, is very likely uh, connected to a sensation of sensations of detachment or a lived experience of atomism and detachment among certain parts of the population that uh, then receive a kind of comforting uh, in-group solidarity on social media that get locked into a certain kind of filter bubble that start, you know, getting uh, information, increasingly, perhaps increasingly radical information fed to them either by people within their filter bubble or by algorithms. And when you're a kind of detached, isolated person, it's kind of comfortable to see yourself get reflected back to you or more, or, you know, others like you reflected back to you. Um, and you know, that, that's a broader phenomenon than populism, but I can see a, a, a way, I can see clearly how uh, that would tap into the kind of sentiments of detachment and feeling put upon that I think are uh, characteristic of the populist appeal. Yeah, well, in listening to what you are saying, I was thinking of um, the diffuse individualism or atomization of the, of the person uh, that stands out clearly when you oppose people in the sense of belonging to something in which you can say we, the people, uh, and uh, populism. Uh, what's, a, what's a difference? What, what, what does it make the difference Maybe I can ask this Ben, who's the expert on populism, exactly what it is to be a people 
as opposed to being just an individual belonging to uh, or caught into a populist dynamic? Well, I think it's important to say there's no such thing as the people. Um, there's no kind of pre-existing group out there that that is the people. But it's so baked into our democratic kind of language and our political imaginary um, that it is the core signifier that kind of underlies everything we do in democracy. Every, nearly every politician, you know, claims to speak in the name of the people. I think what... Um, being, seeing oneself as part of the people or recognising your um, being reflected in a representative's uh, characterization of the people is exactly what you, you were saying. It is a response uh, or a salve to otherwise a very individualistic uh, kind of environment that... that that uh, neoliberalism, um, extreme individualism has, has brought us to this. And we kind of forget we're social creatures. We're, we, we, uh, po politics is generally about groups and is generally about pol political identities go beyond the individual. And it's, it can be incredible. It's incredibly um, uh, powerful to, to feel that you are part of that. Um, I think also now, you know, thinking of living in COVID, we've COVID times, we've all been almost forced into our individual, um, it, that individual situation even more. We, you know, we're all little boxes on a screen. If we're working from home, maybe you're only in your family or individual kind of um, situation. I think those bonds of social solidarity have, have fallen to the wayside to, to some extent um, and I think the sort of thing that Bill was talking about before in, in kind of seeing you know seeing uh, joining joining in discussions uh, mediated through social media can kind of step in as a temporary I'm not, I don't want to say cure but a temporary um, solution to that in the meantime which can have deleterious effects. Yeah, if I can just go, I think that's absolutely yeah. I think it's right on that. And that, um, yeah, not only are we social creatures, as Aristotle says, you know, democracy requires the formation of certain care. I mean, a healthy democ democracy can only exist if people have certain, you know, character traits, certain basic civic virtues, you know, not doesn't need to be, you know, great heroic things, but the capacity to discuss political issues with one another, to think about the common good, to work with, to talk to people whom you disagree with and work with people whom you disagree with. Uh, this brings to mind that really nice chapter in volume two of Alexis de Tocqueville, Democracy in America called Individualism. And in that chapter, he says, you know, he worries that a mass democracy, um, you know, with that celebrates democratic equality uh, can have a negative in could have a negative destination should people as he I mean the image is people retreating first to their small circle of their friends and family then to just their family and then they're I think it was they're closed in the solitude of their own heart right so it's this uh, very atomized picture of, of a kind of modern individual who I think is, um, you know, can encourage both the idea that, hey, we, we all have our own truths and who are these experts to tell me whatever, you know, uh, but also to be kind of very hungry for some kind of uh, substitute for, you know, real uh, civic and social bonds. I and mean, we know that civil society, um, you know, Robert Putnam and others, sociologists have shown that the kind of civil society institutions that in the past have formed, you know, democratic citizens or a, a sense of democratic solidarity are under, a, you know, way a much more strain now, I think, than especially during the pandemic, than when uh, Putnam was writing his, his uh, Bowling Alone. 
Um, so with the collapse of those, organ those, those intermediary civil society organizations that can function as a, as, as a bond between people often who, who may disagree about political issues um, and as a kind of schooling in certain democratic ways of thinking, uh, people may be ripe for the, for the picking either by populists or by algorithms that sort of um, uh, trap people in a kind of spiral of rabbit hole, going down the rabbit hole of kind of more and more extreme uh, political views or conspiracy thinking, uh, which maybe even gives people a sense of a certain kind of power or, or seeing, you know, seeing through the, the, um, the facade portrayed by the elites and so forth, which has, I think, an appeal to a, to someone who is dissatisfied and and uh, detached and lonely, right? Yeah. Well, um, thinking of democracy and functioning of uh, different form of democracies, um, I just want to read a short quote from Freedom House. Uh, and it, this, this is a reading. Uh, the coronavirus outbreak presents a range of new challenges to democracy and human rights. Repressive regimes have responded to the pandemic in ways that serve their political interests, often at the expense of public health and basic freedoms. But even open society face pressures, pressure to accept restrictions that may outlive the crisis and have a lasting effect on liberty. What maybe we see something like that happening or maybe not. How would you assess the statement, Ben? I, I think it's too soon to tell exactly. Um, it, it will do, I mean, we have been living to some extent um, in what the philosopher uh, Agamben would call a state of exception. I mean, it's, it's a, everything's gone kind of off the table and uh, things that were previously un, you know, unthinkable in terms of um, uh, restricting people's liberties. Uh, we started, I, I, here in Melbourne, for example, we, last year we were under a six month lockdown, one of the most stringent in the world. Uh, we couldn't go even more than, we could only go out of our house for one hour a day and we could not go more than five kilometers from our, from our home. Um, now, thankfully, that's worked. We, we now have had over a month of, of zero cases in the state. Um, it depends where that, you know, bringing those liberties back uh, comes back in. And I think the temptation, not only for authoritarian leaders um, who have obviously taken advantage of this state of affairs, but uh, as you said, in more open countries, will be there, and especially in terms of the apparatus now that we've almost had to put in, in terms of surveillance of individuals, um, apps, checking into, um, checking into, you know, restaurants, hotels and so forth, um, monitoring people. I mean, London, for example, was in, in the Western world, the, the great, you know, more cameras per, per mile than anywhere, CCTV cameras. It certainly allowed China to monitor their citizens even more. Is that going to be rolled back? I'm a cynic in that regard. The more, the more information a state has, no matter what, what form that's, that state is, uh, I, I think th this could be an issue in the future. We are receiving interesting questions from, from the floor and um... I, I, I throw them to both Bill and Ben and they will, and they will answer. Uh, we have a, a question from the Philippines. Sheng Dai says, in my country, the Philippines, despite the fake news and troll attacks employed by the government being detailed and graphic, Facebook does not recognize them as fake news and threats, probably because of the language barrier. However, in my personal experience, only one out of five troll accounts that I have reported on Twitter is taken down. My question is, how can social media corporation fix this? And maybe this question also can be extended because 
um, we we have uh, on the other side um, cases in which fake news or let's say um, untruthful messages have been cut down by um, corporations and uh, maybe we can see both the, the sides does it work doesn't work is it a short run or a long run strategy so there's this question about the action of uh, social media corporation and uh, contributing to truth telling in public discourse yeah, I mean, I, I could say something briefly about that. I mean, there's been a recent um, estimation of the number of fake accounts on Twitter uh, was roughly uh, about 15% at, at any given moment of all the accounts on Twitter are, are bots or otherwise fake accounts. That's something that hasn't come up yet in this discussion. I think the role that's another way in which AI and algorithms can really distort the democratic process is through, you know, straightforwardly kind of malicious uh, activity by by bots, by these you know automated accounts that that are, um, you know, many versions of them are built up and then they they share and reshare and reshare and reshare content and another shortcut I think that we often use. In, in figuring out what of this huge sea of information we will focus on is what is hot or what is viral or what is getting shared or what is getting hits, you know, it's, and the infrastructure of bots can, can um, call, you know, artificially rep, create a, uh, uh, attention to, to, distorting messages, right? And problematic messages. And now here is, I, I think there's actually not technical solutions to many of the problems that we're discussing. And I think it's a mistake to, tr to see issues about truth and democracy uh, in, in terms of technical fixes. However, there are some technical things that we can do that are positive. We can, just as AI can be used to, to track people and surveil them and make very accurate predictions about what you know they're likely to click on or pay attention to ai can also be used to identify suspicious accounts and bots and i think more attention should be given to this there's an international dimension to this as well of you know actors from the european union identified china russia and turkey as strangely enough turkey three states that from which a lot of COVID disinformation was stemming, at least last year, uh, from bots, bot accounts, right? So there's a kind of international geopolitical dimension to this as well. Um, but there is, there is certainly more that can be done on the technical side. Uh, there is another question that is um, possibly related. Um, it's a question uh, that comes from uh, Università Cattolica, Michele Candiani. Do you think that the increasing polarization of public debate, especially in social media, is a consequence of identity politics or what else? Ben, can you take this question? Uh, well, populism in, in a way is a form of identity politics, although I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wary of putting the blame on identity politics because I think that's that's kind of what politics are and ha have been, you know, since the new left um, and new social movements arose in the 60s and 70s. Um, I don't, I think it's a false binary to kind of say, oh, it's all, this is identity politics fault because I, identity politics arose because there was, so, so many people's identities were erased and ignored um, in those initial broad social movements. So I think identity politics is not the issue here and that identity politics can work um, alongside kind of broader social movements. I think we just need to look at Black Lives Matter in, in the States. I mean, 
Black Lives Matter is a, to some extent, an identity politics claim. It is about a particular racial, uh, ethnic identity, but it was a broad social justice movement group that ended up bringing in an, a, a vast array of identities. So I'm really wary of putting all the blame on identity politics because A, I think it's impossible and kind of to, to go back what we need to ignore people's identities now. I think that's, that's a problem. I think um, it relies on a little bit of a, a rosy view of, of what the past and what past social movements look like. Um, so in short, identity politics is a bigger part of uh, how liberalism and uh, kind of individualization more broadly, not just politically, but more broadly has operated. And to pretend that that can't work, that, that we can get rid of that or that that's desirable to get rid of it, um, I think, I think is problematic. We're, we're not going to go back to, to the, old, the old days. So uh, it's, it's, it's part and parcel of the story, but it's, it's placing the blame on identity politics is not the right way to move forward. There's another question that is, let's say, more focused on understanding the situation and another one that is more on solutions. So I'll go with the question on understanding the kind of world we are living in. It's a question from Andrea Azevedo Alves uh, from Portugal. What do you think is the potential for authoritarian powers to manipulate populist movements and trends in liberal democracy for the benefit of their own foreign policy goals. Here we have an international connection that shows the possible externalities of um, national political debate. Who can take this question? I'll say something about that. I mean, I think that, that there is that's, it's a very important question that there, again, there is a kind of geopolitical dimension to this and um, democracies, I mean, we don't exist in a vacuum or, you know, these, we're not islands, certainly, and, and our, our domestic politics is strongly shaped by um, the actions of other democracies and as well as authoritarian regimes. I mean, a, a clear example, this kind of gets at the, the last question a little bit. Um, in 2016, some of the Russian uh, bot-based interference in the American election uh, took, you know, especially cynical form in which, um, you know, negativity bias, confirmation bias, in-group bias, all these things were stoked on both sides of issues. So it, it actually involving sometimes Black Lives Matter. So this, the same accounts that were um, involved in sort of sharing dubious data or dubious information uh, on the pro-Black Lives Matter side, those same accounts were later found to have also been involved in uh, sharing equally or if not more dubious stuff on sort of blue lives matter side and in fact uh, at a particular protest in texas it was found that that both the protesters and the counter the accounts of the, both the protesters and the counter protesters or at least a significant number of them had you know contact with this troll farm in in uh russia so there i think the date a particular uh dimension of this that is problematic in a, in a free, a liberal, open, ostensibly open society is that the way that this whole architecture of social media and surveillance capitalism and um, it's very opaque to people, right? We don't, it's who, who's, where is, how does this stuff work? Uh, how is, you know, where is this content coming from? How, how is it decided that my feed favors these things rather than, than other things. People don't know, don't know these things. And um, it's all kind of a black box to us, which is great if you are a uh, actor that's trying to sow discord in a democracy, because then you can uh, 
especially when you have such great um, history and honing propaganda, uh, you know, propaganda and counter propaganda, um, as authoritarian regimes tend to have pretty good background in working with propaganda. So that if they can insinuate themselves into a, a fundamentally opaque black box system, uh, it's quite a, a uh, fruitful avenue for sowing discord in, in democracies. Yeah, as for solutions, there's a question by Takehito Kamata from Sofia University in Tokyo uh, that asks the following. In order to correct the influence of contemporary populist manipulation of information, how could university scientists and researchers work together with elected officials and as well as the media to provide evidence-based information for promoting health and wellness under the influence of COVID-19 pandemic? That looks like a task for Taku, yeah. Can you maybe, maybe Ben can start and then we can go on? I mean, it's an enormous task, isn't it? I think, I think what it speaks to is what can be done? Okay, more funding uh, for, well, at least stopping uh, cuts to higher education and research. Um, I think public, I think public broadcasting and, and having trustworthy media uh, is, is really important in this regard. Um, I, to some extent, I, and, and, I, and I think government working, working cooperatively with, with those, those organs of um, the fourth estate and the higher education sector, um, rather than necessarily being in conflict with them. I mean, maybe I'm speaking from my Australian experience here, but I mean, the, the, that, that's a, the, the government here uh, constantly attacks the higher education sector and the national broadcaster. So that's a, that's a bit of a problematic thing when then you're looking for, um, to work together and have authority in, in, in that regard. One thing I think that has been something that's, um, that's been done in this area for the last few years where you've kind of seen this coalescence of those groups is kind of fact checking uh, and the like. That being said, I'm not sure how effective that can be when people are, are, um, uh, are so into these communities and into some of these figures. I saw a political fact check the other day that actually made me laugh out loud. It was about a Facebook video that had been going around and the facts were, this was what the fact check said. Yes, Joe Biden is a human. No, Joe Biden did not have snakes coming out of his um, out of his jacket in in that debate. And I just thought, what is the, you know what is the point like of fact checking this kind of thing? Some I think to some extent the cat's out of the bag that goes that goes with some of those um, back to what we we're talking about the the epistemic authorities. Uh, I mean, how do you fact check that? How do you have a rational debate with that? that that's a real issue. Yeah. And uh, um, the time, yes, because uh, in all cases, someone has to take decisions and some decisions, especially during uh, the COVID pandemic are hard decisions and uh, we, would, we, we would like to have, let's say, a, a better um, public dialogue on what is the priority, how can we make decision based on practical wisdom. Um, and this is something that maybe researchers and university can, can support. What kind of process can help a good public discourse that leads to a good way of behavior? What is the wise way of moving on? I mean, I, I, I am no authority. Can I can only speak as a human here and not an, <laughs> as an authority on wisdom, but I, I do think that um, the fourth is, I mean, in the COVID crisis, we, to my view, I mean, the way that I, my philosophical background, I, I do not think that 
practical decisions admit of purely quantitative, measurable, utilitarian resolutions, right? And, and, I, and I'm not sure that the fourth estate has been great in the COVID crisis in sort of presenting COVID from a single kind of dimensional, a single sort of monistic dimension of just eliminating all COVID cases or, and not really uh, discussing, uh, I mean, the decisions being made in COVID and, and now in dealing with this crisis have to balance a variety of what I think are incommensurable goods, um, both you know, human lives, uh, as well as um, you know the people's relationships, their their mental health, their livelihoods, their potential to maybe see their grandkids one last time, and you know, a, whole, a whole host of things. That, I mean, these are difficult human decisions. And I think it's a mistake to have presented, at least I see a lot in Portugal, the way it's presented is very much a numerical sort of thing. It's, you know, how many people in the hospital, how many people, and in a kind of look measuring quantities of something, which is certainly an important dimension of it, no doubt, but there has not been, I think, a very rich multifaceted discussion of what we're going through and the various trade-offs and costs that are uh, that we're taking. I think here the humanities in particular, you know, there, there's been so much celebration of STEM fields for in, at least in the US for the last 10, 15 years, uh, which um, maybe incline people to see problems from a more technical or engineering kind of perspective. I think that the, there is a crucial role for the humanities and for philosophy, for sociology, political theory, in helping us to see a problem as complex as this pandemic in its complexity, rather than to give a kind of uh, one-sided uh, account of, of it, whether it's you know just counting number of cases or without you know appreciation of other dimensions or uh, simplistic kind of populists, you know, this is all a hoax or it's all, uh, um, you know, a yeah. fraud or something like that, so. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Ben, would you like to give a final remark for us because we are running out of time? Sure, I'll just jump on what Bill said there um, about the humanities. I mean, the matter of the fact is that the way out of this, obviously, like, is scientific, but the, the long durée will be about visions and narratives. I think people, uh, you know, get a, uh, about hearing about narratives or storytelling and that, that seems to be fake. It's not. P politics is about creating a vision and where we're going and, and people seeing a particular future. And I think that's going to be the next important step. How, you know, the, science has done um, amazing things in only the last year, but what people put forward as visions and narratives and hopes for the future, science, quant quantitative data is not going to be able to provide that. Thank you. We are drawing near to the close, so I would like to close with some, something in Italian and then I will translate. Cammina l'uomo quando sa bene dove andare. The people, men and women, walk when they know where they want to go. And uh, I think this is something that we can take as, uh, it's not a conclusion, it's just a thought that came, actually it's a line of a song. So um, thank you very much, William, Benjamin. Uh, it has been a very interesting discussion and uh, I thank very much all the people that were connected and the Sacro Network that allowed this very global seminar to be held. Thank you again and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.